Everybody knows that when you have your own business, especially in the beauty industry, we have so much pressure on us to do a great job for our clients, to make everybody happy. And we're, we tend to be people people and people pleasers. But in running a business that actually goes smoothly, unfortunately, there are uncomfortable conversations that come up. Whether that is cancellations, taking deposits, setting boundaries with your clients for when they can talk to you, and what your schedule is, having to do redos, dealing with refunds, all that kind of thing. There are a lot of stressful conversations that need to be had. Fortunately, having software and policies and boundaries and systems is going to make it so much easier for you. So fortunately today, we have a special guest, Marshall, who is the head of sales for an amazing software company called Mangoman. Mangoman is more than just booking software for salons and spas. They make setting boundaries, having policies, and putting systems in place so easy for beauty professionals. So let's jump into my conversation with Marshall all about how to make uncomfortable conversations with clients go so much smoothly with Mangoment. Marshall, I'm so happy to be chatting with you today all about those hard conversations that need to be had in beauty businesses and how we can use policies and guidelines and boundaries to make those hard conversations easier. So I'm really pumped up about this topic and I'm so happy that you're here. Thank you, Stephanie. I'm happy to be here as well. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah. Really looking forward. Yeah, it's going to be so good. So if you can just briefly tell us a little bit about you and um, what you do at Mango Mint. Yeah, so I'm uh, head of sales here at Mango Mint. And, you know, I'm a mother of one, work from home, but my background is really in the salon space. So mm -hmm. I've been a stylist myself, built and grown and sold my salon and now work full time still with my people, but on the software side of things. Oh, that's so cool. So, um, I mean, I'm sure that's like a really long story, but like, how did it come to be just like really quickly? Like, how did you come to transition from like working behind the chair and then, you know, managing a salon to working on the software side of things? That's such a cool transition. Yeah. I feel like I wish it was more climactic, but I, I, it was one of those moments where after I had my son, I knew that there was something else I was called to. Um, and about two years after I had him, I was back behind the chair and something just hit me. I, I didn't know what it was, but I decided that I needed to set up systems and have, you know, processes in place in the salon to where I could step away. Mm -hmm. um, the first item on, on that list was finding software that would, you know, hum quietly in the background, but help support those things that I had put in place. Yeah. And it just so happened that through that process of finding software and looked at 10 different companies, something really clicked with the person I was working with at Mangoment who, you know, fast forward, ended up being the CEO who was doing sales at that time. Mm -hmm. And it just came to grow into a relationship. And I started with the company as one of like a early, early adopters of the software. Um, and then officially sold my salon in 2020. That is so cool. Congratulations on that huge jump. That's such a cool experience. Now you're the head of sales and you help other salon owners and beauty professionals figure out what's the right kind of tools and systems for them. Um, and if yeah. Mango Mint is a good fit for them. Um, so today we're talking about a little bit about Mango Mint, but on a broader scale, we're talking about uncomfortable conversations that come yep. up with salon clients. You've been a salon owner, you've been behind the chair for years and years. So I'm sure you've had your fair share of uncomfortable or difficult conversations. And I love that you talked about like systems and that kind of goes hand in hand with like policies and boundaries and that kind of thing. So that's the topic for today. Um, I, my first question for you is why are some conversations so hard to have with salon clients and what kind of things can go wrong if we shy away from those difficult conversations? I think you nailed it when you said shy away. Um, I want to preface this by saying that there, you know, so many different types of personalities, so many different types of people. And for some of us, those conversations, conversations just never get easier. Um, it's kind of like, you know, the idea of I have never had a fear of speaking on a stage 
but it still took me a lot of time, training and effort to become good at speaking in mm-hmm. front of a group. So it's not to say that, you know, a shy person can't do this, but it's all about your preparation. And it's all about doing the hard work of having the policy in place having the understanding of the why and really thinking about, you know, I always like to look at it from the shyest, most introverted person in the room. And if they know why they're setting this policy because of what it's protecting in them, Mm -hmm. doing that hard work at the beginning really helps you to understand, you know, what that needs to look like and what the end resolution always needs to be for you. Yeah. Um, And you're actually protecting, you know, I think of it like a legal contract, you know, when you go into a partnership with somebody, when you sign a lease, a lot of the things in that lease are not only to protect the property owner, but it's also to protect you. Yeah, so it's about preparation. But then, you know, for some of us, it's going to be a lot about practice. Mm -hmm. I find that having policies in place that are really like set in stone, it takes, it kind of takes the discomfort out of things in a little bit because it's no longer personal. It's like, no, no, Mm -hmm. this is just the policy. This is just the way that I do things. And it, you don't have to use that mental energy with every single difficult situation that comes up. You just like have a checklist of like, okay, this is how it's done. I don't even think about it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Um, okay. So let's talk about some of those difficult things that can happen. Um, first, what I want to chat about is cancellations. Everyone yeah. has them. Uh, I'm sure that, you know, when you were a salon owner and working behind the chair, they happen to you too. So what do you do about cancellations and how can you reduce their frequency happening? You know, it's interesting. I have seen this go two ways. Um, Personally, I am a proponent of a very strong and strict cancellation policy Um, that may have been my salon was in California in a very busy market. And so if you no showed to an appointment, we charged you 100 percent of that cancellation fee. Wow. Now, some of the ways that that was supported, it really is about how you deliver it. I don't believe in posting signs all over your salon about it. I just think for me, again, this is my personal opinion, could get a little tacky. Um, But I do think communicating it and having it set up to where they have to acknowledge it at some point. Right. Um, That looks like an actual toggle that they have to select in online booking Mm -hmm. um, as well as booking over the phone. We have a feature called Express Booking. They actually have to select with their own hand a toggle that says, I agree to this policy. Right. And do you write the policy out there or do you just say like, I agree to the policies in general and then they would have to like click and read the whole thing? No, it's right there. Okay. So there's no click into. Um, Same thing with notifications. So in Mango Mint, all of our notifications are gonna have your cancellation policy. Um, But regardless, any software you're using, if you're texting back and forth in, in Instagram exchange and you're booking that way, I think the communication needs to be upfront. So here is the communication and it needs to be in a way where we can say, you know, this is what I sent you. This is what you agreed to. Okay. So it has to be written. It has to be clear. It has to be concise. The harder part is like you actually have to enforce it. Yeah. So I want to talk about the enforcing in just a second, because like that's the part where it's like a lot of us are squirming and we don't want to piss anyone off. But about like the communicating it, I know you said that Mango Mint has like a feature where it's like toggle on if you agree to this is my cancellation policy. And then you said about like Instagram, like a lot of people are booking through Instagram or Facebook Messenger, etc. Do you just kind of like when someone agrees to their appointment on there? you copy paste like what your cancellation policy is and then you say are you okay with this before i go ahead with booking you yes i mean sure that's exactly it um again this goes back to i'm a huge proponent of just having scripts or i Mm -hmm. call them snippets um you know early on in my career i took a course um that was created by lance courtney called top gun front desk and um big fan of his looking back i'm like gosh i really really dove into the cheesiness early on which i'm glad i did because it helped me practice these things yeah having scripts in place having fun ways of interacting with the customer so it's not just like this dry reading so even over the phone you know the thing that i disliked most about the whole phone conversation in a salon 
um, was having to answer it, A, but also having to make that interaction fun. Um, so for me, I think that express booking takes that conversation out because usually on the phone, it's like, you know, going through the whole spiel, we've got you down for Monday at this time, this is where to park, here's our cancellation policy, and, and you're just overloading them. Yeah. The one thing that I do like about express booking is that it looks like, okay, Stephanie, we've got you in on, you know, Monday at 1 p.m. In order to complete this appointment, I'll just need you to open the text I just sent you, input your data there, and your appointment will be booked. You right. open the phone, you read it, you do the hard stuff. Um, so that's one is that it that's just has cool. to be clear. That same snippet that's that's in our software can also be the one if you're using Facebook business, they, they allow you to save responses. Mm -hmm. I guess it's meta now. Sorry. Let's be real. <laughs> so you can save these responses and this should be your number one saved response because it's like you get through that conversation, you know, for those who are looking to learning how to market, learning how to do those ads, it's really important that they're not just doing the marketing piece, that they have that whole back end ready. So when they have that first conversion and they're ready to celebrate, it doesn't also become their first no show. Yeah. So that's just a snippet I would have saved whatever your policy is. Yeah, that's such a good tip. So what are some good things to actually include in a cancellation policy? Like what, I know you said like you could go so many different directions. Your cancellation policy was like pretty strict. What are some other like pretty common ones? Yeah, so I came from a background. I worked for like a Sassoon salon um, when I first started my career. I specialized, so I did haircuts only. Um, but I remember watching the colorists who would have like a color makeover on their day that would no show and that would just kill a four, four and a half, five hour chunk of their wow. day. Yeah. And at the time there wasn't software that held cards on file. Mm -hmm. So it, it, there was no possible repercussion. Um, so one, I have also seen really successful salons just have no cancellation policy. And that's part of their culture. Like we're not going to hold your card on file. We're not gonna hold you to it, but we're just going to go so heavy in the direction of like getting people booked and like not worrying about that and having this wait list. And like for those people, if that works, I think that it just has to fit into your culture. It's kind of mm -hmm. like Southwest every single thing they do, everything they do in marketing, every decision they make feeds into the idea that they are going to be low cost. So I think first you just have to decide what your culture is. Mm -hmm. Then you have to decide if you're the type of salon doing massive color changes, huge expensive appointments, especially if you're doing extensions where you have to order sometimes thousands of dollars worth of supplies, hair for that appointment. Yeah. You're, you're Cancellation policy should reflect that. Yeah. Um, could be up until X point we charge for me. I kept it really simple up until 24 hours before or I'm sorry, up until 24 hours before the appointment. If you let us know, it would be a 50% charge. Right. After, in that window, if you no show, it was 100%. Right. So those you know, from that window onward, that was just it. It was very simple, very straightforward. The other thing is, I think you have to reflect that when you charge them. Mm -hmm. I personally always reached out again. That was just part of my my culture. I sent them a really nice note. Hey, just want to make sure everything's okay because we don't know what's going on. Something terrible might have happened. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to send, have again, another snippet where you're reiterating the policy and you're just sending them a little note. You know, you will be charged for this. You know, if I'm missing anything, please let me know. And then I always swap the line item on the actual charge. I know I'm going a little bit ahead, but I would just like strike through the full highlight, put a line item that says no show fee with the fee. And that's what I would process. Right. OK. All right. And do you feel like it was like hard to like when you first started introducing this cancellation policy? Did you find that it was hard, first of all, to get people to agree to it? Did you feel like it like reduced the number of people who felt comfortable booking with you the first time? It is, but you have to look at it as a filter. So that's mm -hmm. why I say for the business who wants just no policy, doesn't want to hold cards on file, they have to recognize that they are inevitably going to have the customers that chose not to go to the salon that does have a strict cancellation policy. Yeah. So this goes 
to your ICP? Like who is your ideal profile that you're serving? And are, is that someone that respects cancellation policies and boundaries? Yeah. And so did you find that pretty much your cancellations completely dried up? We would have them, but the funny thing was when you really start doing that filter and you know exactly who you want to serve, you're going to get to a point where the one cancellation that does come through, you're kind of like, okay, this person obviously respects my policy. I had during the pandemic, a couple of women, I guess during, I guess we're still in, I don't know. I had a couple <laughs> of clients that have been clients of the salon for five years. They saw that a no-show charge came through. And next thing I know, that stylist had a hundred dollar Venmo tip. So not only did they just get charged mm -hmm. the no-show, they were like, oh my gosh, I cannot believe I didn't show up to my appointment. Yeah. I am so sorry. Like, what else can I do? Yeah. So I think it really goes back to like, what is the culture you're trying to create mm -hmm. as long as it's communicated? And people don't read. I mean, that's just the reality. A lot of times people just like zoom through, they tap the thing, they click the thing and they sign to it. But when you're building the right clientele and you're attracting the right people, those are people that are going to respect your policies. So just make sure your policies are in alignment with who you're you're wanting to serve or who you are serving. Yeah, absolutely. OK, so last question about um, cancellations. Um, I think a lot of the reason why people like pull back from them is, first of all, that, that other question I was asking you about, like, does that kind of discourage some people from booking? But you're saying, no, it actually it actually encourages and it's a filter for the right kind of clients that you want. And then the second thing that's uncomfortable about cancellations is the enforcing part. Like for someone maybe who is new in business and maybe they're not at that like super confident level in their business, what is a good way to start building that confidence to enforce that policy and kind of letting go of that fear of people I guess, lashing out at you or getting angry or saying it's not fair. Yeah. You know, I see this come up a lot in our community, especially with like the, the environment around like the solopreneur at this mm -hmm. point. There is so much on that one person's plate, oh, similar yeah. to a spa owner, that this just becomes something that could be very overwhelming. And it's funny because I started to realize as you were asking me this, I have become very biased because when I started using Mangomet, that's when I let go of having to manage this. It was, I put it into the software. I know that it's being communicated. Mm -hmm. I know if they're using online booking or if they're using express booking, they are agreeing to it. And so for me, it's about, it is easier for me to put those things in place. And like I said, let this software do its work in the background to where if they need to reach out to me because they disagree with the policy after the fact, that's going to be an email to the business because right. that's our line of communication. So again, you have to decide if you're like a solopreneur or somebody that has really given your clients a lot of access to you, mm -hmm. meaning your phone number, they have your email, they're yeah. calling the business. You have to really decide like that goes back to the boundaries in the beginning. What type of communication is allowed? And are you giving every contact detail you have to this person where they're getting you on your personal phone, um, where they're then going to go leave a review? You kind of have to like front load that. So it, again, it looks like communicating it by having it all over in your policies communicate you have to communicate on the front end i would say the same thing with pricing if i go to a salon and i sit down and they consult with me and they do not give me a quote on how long they expect this to take and or how long they expect how much they expect this to cost i will actually stop the service and say you know i'm just not completely comfortable because i don't understand what i'm getting myself into at this point because right. i have been surprised as a stylist before and i just don't like that feeling so that said, had I looked back on my messages with that provider and saw that they had already sent me their pricing and they were already straightforward with it, I could have just confirmed it or their policy or mm -hmm. this. So write it out, make sure it is sent to every person in some way. Easier if it's just your software doing it for you, for sure. Yeah. But if it's there's that. And then I do not think that you have to over communicate it. I think, you know, 
when you go to Nordstrom, you just have an assumption that if you don't love something, you bring it back. Now, if you're not familiar with Nordstrom, it's like one of, because they don't have them in Canada, but they're one of the largest U.S. retailers that is known for their return policy. Mm. It's basically like, I worked there for many years. It was very frustrating, <laughs> but <laughs> known. And so the interesting thing is now, if you go to the dress section in Nordstrom, they've got these tags that yes. go around, around the so bottom. That you can't, up. So that you can't wear a dress and then bring it back. I've seen those so before. So that is a clear communication of their new policy on dresses because they're saying, hey, this policy is not to be abused. So there's different interesting ways you can communicate these things. But that one little note on the dress tells you everything you need to know. So yeah. that one little note on online booking needs to be able to think that needs to be the thing that tells them everything they need to know. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that like having those those exact policies and those systems in place, even for those people who are like scared or lacking confidence or always, you know, the people pleasers who are afraid to piss somebody off, it kind of pulls mm -hmm. away that responsibility from you and puts it on them of like, okay, they're agreeing to it. They know about it. It's just my policy. Um, yeah. So yeah, I love the way that you explained that. All right. So let's talk about something similar um, related deposits. What are your thoughts about taking deposits? I don't like them. Mm. I, I like them for specific things, but you know, I struggle with this. I like having the ability for a business to take them if that makes them feel safe. Right. But the reality is that's what a deposit is. It's something that makes a business owner or a provider feel safe. And if it works for you, great. However, what I don't like is a deposit that is applied towards something that isn't what it is. So I'm going to use the tattoo shop as an example. I have a lot of friends in the industry and we're talking permanent artwork on someone's body. This is a really serious thing. Same thing with like permanent makeup, um, eyebrows, lips. I think those fade a little bit, a little bit easier because they're a little like lighter handed with the uh, pigmentation. But what tattoo shops that I have gone to do that I actually really like is that they book a consultation first and you pay $50, $100, whatever it is for the consultation. Mm -hmm. the tattoo consultation is something where they're looking at what body part, what is all your inspiration? Now, if you're going to a custom shop, that artist now has to go take all of that and draw something that is going on your body. Mm -hmm. So when I look at like a $50, $100 consultation fee, I give them all my inspiration, my photos, my this, the, that. I started thinking about it and I was like, they're going to go spend two hours drawing this thing. And they kind of include that in their hourly price for actually doing it. Right. So that makes sense to me, but it still goes, gosh, there's a whole, when I started dialing it down to the drawing time, the tattooing time and all of this and dividing it down by the hourly cost, I'm like, wow, oh, it's actually like not as much as a hairdresser charges for hair color. Yeah. So for me, I look at it as a deposit. What I don't like about a deposit is here's $50 towards my... $300 color appointment that is being applied to the $300 color appointment. And I need to cancel it way outside of my policy. Now what happens is the business owner has to actually decide what they do with that. Are deposits refundable or not? Do deposits move with the appointment or not? Mm -hmm. What is the deposit actually for? Right. Is it for reserving time on the calendar? Or is it a portion of the payment towards the service that they have not had rendered? Mm. Things all matter when you go to the bank because somebody disputes the $50 deposit. Right. Because if the bank says this is a deposit towards a highlight service that they never had, they win. Mm -hmm. Now, they always are going to try and side with their customer, but you really have to think about what is the deposit for? Right. If deposit is a, a line item that is holding time on your calendar. It's a little bit different, but they should just pay that. And that should be that. Mm -hmm. If the deposit is for a consultation for an extension service, I don't think the fee should roll into the extension service. 
when they have the consultation, you can then decide if, you know, if they are moving forward with the service, then sure, you can decide if you're going to give them, you know, $50 off their extension service, right. but they took 15 to 20 minutes of your time to consult on this service and they may or may not move forward to become an extension client. So fundamentally, I as a consumer don't like the feel if I'm going to a new business and booking straight online of paying a deposit mm -hmm. because I don't usually see businesses that outline a deposit policy. Um, and I think that it on the back end does create more work for the, the owner or the provider if there's changes that need to be made. I personally think an, a zero authorization card on file does the trick, if not better, nine out of 10 times. If you're looking at really, really high end services where you're selling the hair, but you're trying to sell the extension hair with the service, it makes sense that they would have to pay for the hair so you can order it for the service. Mm -hmm. But again, Oftentimes those things require a consultation to begin with. So that flow to me looks like you pay for a consultation, whether it's virtual or in person. In that consultation, you build the service for their extension service and they pay for maybe 50% of that service to book it with you. And again, you still need a policy around what happens if they have to cancel that. Yeah, yeah, that's, that makes total sense. and. You know, the way that you explain the cancellation thing, it actually makes more sense in, in a lot of ways to do it that way than to like request that they put down money because you're still you're still protecting yourself if you have their credit card on file. It's not like you're you don't have that same fear, I think, of like, oh, they're going to cancel on me and then I'm out for four hours and I, I've just lost tons of money. The quick caveat to that is if you are somebody that wants to raise the barrier of what it takes to book with you, mm -hmm. meaning you're running your books in a way where you're not really accepting new clients, sure, charge a deposit, charge whatever. But if you are somebody that's looking to grow your books, you 100% need to lower the barrier of someone being able to get in touch with you, Yeah, to get on your books. All yeah, that things. makes total sense. Okay, so let's continue the discussion about boundaries and policies. Um, you kind of um, touched on this earlier about boundaries when communicating with clients. Um, so you were talking about how much access do clients have to you and how wow. much have you put yourself out there to be able to receive informal communications, um, it, unprofessional communications. Like I see in Facebook groups all the time of like stylists or beauty professionals, like texting back and forth with their clients. And so many of those conversations are just like so cringy and like unprofessional. And it just kind of, it, it, it almost is like ripe for emotions. And that's what we don't want, right? Is we want to be able to like pull away the emotions and just be really professional. So can you tell us a little bit about like where you see kind of those boundaries and communications going wrong when it comes to like how we talk to clients, where we talk to clients, when we talk to clients. Yeah, gosh, this one could really explode. So you might have to reel me in. <laughs> um, I have kind of like shifted the way I think about this over the years. Um, again, I think I'm still of the age where my first 10 years in the industry, all we had was phone and email and email was still not heavily used. Uh, so I really love having very strict scripts. Um, we never had a front desk at the salon that I own. I'm sorry. We did have a front desk. We just never had a full time front desk team. Right. So we ran it more like kind of co-op style where every stylist would participate. Um, but in terms of like phone communication, we had a 24 hour response, you know, level agreement where within the salon, we would always get back to them within 24 hours, whether that was a callback or an email in regards to what they were asking. So again, this goes back to like, what are your processes? What are you committing to? Mm -hmm. You can't really commit to anything through a text message because there's no response saying, hey, this is my policy around texting. So I have a couple tricks that I started using and um, kind of a little sneak peek of something that we're launching. When the pandemic hit, everyone was texting because it was like, oh, you need to have your client text you when they are or call when they arrive. Well, that wasn't right. reasonable because a lot of us had to let go of any support help whatsoever. So everyone went to texting. So one tool I started using at that time 
was called Simple Texting. And it's actually like a two-way messaging software that you can have the app on your phone, but you can also just have it open and open in a browser. Um, if you're somebody that did get like a landline, landline, do we have those anymore? If you did get a landline for your business, you could actually activate that number on simple texting. Cool. So that way customers are texting your business number. Mm -hmm. It's a separate app on your phone. And the thing that I really loved about it now, of course, you had to pay for these response messages is you could actually set an away message. Mm. So that was one thing that really helped because I could communicate expectations around messaging within this away message that would auto respond during off hours. Right. So that was one thing. The second thing is using some sort of, I don't like bots. Like if you even go on mangomit.com, which please don't do this as a test, but if you go on mangomit.com and you send us a chat message, it's a real person from my team communicating back to you. Yeah. So there are messengers. Wix has one. If you have a Wix, don't you like encourage Wix websites? Wix websites are awesome for sure. I think that they're really easy for any solopreneur, entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. So they have a messenger. Facebook even has a messenger, Meta, that you can set a return message just to like give an expectation. Mm -hmm. But all of your messaging can be condensed to that. And it's something that is on your phone, but it's also on your computer for when you have those work hours. Now, that way you can communicate a, this is when I'll get back to you. If everyone just has your direct phone number and they see your messages are blue, they're going to just hit you up as they need because you're now their friend on text. Mm -hmm. Same thing with Instagram messaging. If you have a business account, you can have something that responds to set some sort of expectation or guideline. Now, this just goes back to who you are personally. If you have no boundaries around when people can communicate with you, you're going to be that person with like the higher cortisol. You're going to wake up knowing you have all these messages, whether they're professional or friendly or not. So it's going to be a hard switch if that's who you are right now. Mm -hmm. But you really consider like what quality of life do you want? Yeah. So do you think it's more about just like being available on any platform, just making sure that you set the hours? Or do you feel like there's certain platforms where we should try to encourage clients to communicate with us? You know, I have so many clients that were, that were my clients since 2006. You know, I did their kids weddings. Like we were, we were friends. We are friends. I love them dearly. Some of them felt like sisters. Some of them felt like mothers to me. You know, now I don't do hair. I live in a different state and they get to watch my life through Instagram and they send responses all the time. I feel zero need to respond when they send me a heart eye emoji. It doesn't mean that I don't love them. It just means that from the very beginning, these people, our time to connect was when we were together. Right. We don't have a time to connect anymore, but it does not mean that it changes the way that I feel love or care for them. And I look at it this way. The majority of anyone listening to this sees their clients more often than they see some of their friends. Mm hmm. So I think you're giving them plenty of your time and yourself in those interactions, but you're also delivering them a wonderful service. Mm -hmm. If they connect with you deeply during that service, if they feel the need that they want to reach out to you and text you on a random Tuesday, by all means, but you have to decide, like, why are you giving them the, your cell phone number? So personally, my clients never had my cell phone number for personal use. If they had it, it was because I randomly was out one day and needed to let them know that. Um, but otherwise, all communication went through the salon, went through the business channels, and then we connected at their appointment. Okay. Yeah, that's awesome. I think that that's a really good way of doing it. And like you, I like that you're kind of giving everyone permission to like not feel guilty about it. You do not have to be at clients back and call, and you don't have to try to be their best friend all the time either. Um, so I wanted to ask you another thing about being kind of like at the beck and call of clients. We talked about the communication side of it. How about like, oh, before I go on, you said that there's something that Mangoment is working on for this feature and you kind of like teased it, but you didn't tell us what it was. So we're talking about simple texting and I, to be honest, I've been a little bit resistant to the whole text thing with customers. Um, 
However, we are launching two-way texting. Cool. And the reason this is meaningful is we're doing it in a way that I can get on board with, which is how do we actually reduce the need for a customer to reach out to you personally, but create the paper trail of important information in one place. So it's like, here's the container for this. All important information communication sits within the software. So you can completely free up your phone and not have that feel like they can't reach you. So again, this works well for the solopreneur because it will give them a way, granted maybe it's not the best for them, but like if you really want to isolate it and you wanna pay the price to like get everything in one place so you can turn work off when you leave it, that is one thing that's really gonna help and it's gonna live inside of the client profile. So it's just like their own little portal of right. if they have whatever their formulas were, whatever forms they filled out and whatever communication they've sent. So the next time they say, you know, I, my phone auto deletes my text after 30 days. I like the feeling of clearing out. Mm -hmm. um, but once we have that feature, I look back and go, actually, that would be really nice. So when Sally says, oh, well, I sent you a text to tell you I was canceling, I can just pull that thread up and be like, you know, we didn't receive it, but thank you for letting us know, like, this is what it is. <laughs> Sally. Um, yeah, I love that. So it's kind of like you have your customer profile in the Mangomint software, and then you've got all their information there. In addition to that, you've got your text message threads with them all saved. Is that how it works? Yes. So that, uh, that's how it will work. That's, you know, how, that's it how it works. Work. Right now, our development team might disagree with me slightly. <laughs> but yeah, so that's going to be launching by the end of the year. Oh, that's so cool. That's a really good feature. Um, okay, so what I was going to ask you was about like not needing to be at the beck and call of clients, not just with communication, but also with your time and your schedule. Um, especially when people are just starting out, I feel like they want, I've heard this so many times, like I want to try to fit you in to my schedule. Um, yeah. How can we try to take that pressure off? And what are some of like the maybe like, I know it's simple. Just you would say, don't do it. Like stick with your hours. You've got your hours. Just stick with them. But like, what, what are some things yeah. that like people can do to like relieve that kind of like pressure to make room for people? Well, first of all, it, it, it always happens the same way, right? It's a Thursday afternoon and Joan calls and she says, I'm so sorry. I have a wedding on Saturday. I need to get in tomorrow. Is there any way you can squeeze me in? And whether that's you taking the phone call, your front desk person taking the phone call um, or the message, it's always like she needs an answer. But what we have to first acknowledge is if Joan has been seeing you before, this is learned behavior. Hmm. She thinks she can do this for a reason. So the first thing that needs to happen is you need to set those boundaries for yourself then you need to work whether you're working with a coach or you're working with you or you're you know just utilizing the resources at hand you have to decide what your policy is around that yeah and then you need to figure out how to communicate it and you need to practice communicating it so for me that looks like because I, I was guilty of this you know before i had my son I, I worked up until 37 weeks he came early probably because i was just like going so hard that mm. by days after my maternity leave started, it was like, cool, I don't even get a little break before you come. But I remember those last few weeks, it was during the holidays. And I was just like, it didn't matter. I would do a 12 hour day. I did not mm. care. It, it just was what I was doing. So when I came back, I really had to reassess and look at this. Like I've taught my customers that this is okay. Yeah. So a, I had to set my schedule and say, this is my schedule. I had to set a something after the end of my work day, which at this point was having a child that I had to get home to. For you, it might be scheduling a bar class at seven o'clock and you're done at six and going ahead and prepaying for that bar class. Hmm. There needs to be pain on the other side of breaking your own boundary. Yeah. There needs to be something that tells you if you don't do what you said you're going to do, there is going to be pain there because as human beings, we do everything to avoid 
pain and gain pleasure. So we have to set the boundary, set the thing, and then decide how we're going to enforce that upon ourselves. Then we need to learn how to communicate it. So when Joan calls on Thursday, we hop up, we grab the phone, we say, hey, Joan. She goes, I'm so sorry, blah, blah, the whole thing. We have to let her know. Under normal circumstances, I cannot squeeze you in on a day that I am fully booked. What we're communicating to her is that what you're doing is not a normal circumstance. <laughs> this isn't a regular thing to just mm -hmm. call somebody and demand that you get in tomorrow. Then if it is something that is within your boundaries and you could take them and it's not going to cause pain in other areas of your life, you let them know. Tomorrow I can get you in on this day and this time under one circumstance. Joan says, I'll do anything. Mm -hmm. You let her know under the circumstance that you pre-book your next two appointments with me in order to make sure that we aren't in this same situation again. Right. Now she do her hair, you squeeze her in that last time. She agrees to your policy to book those next two appointments. If she knows shows to one of them, you enforce the policy you've already set. Okay. That is such a good tip. I love that. And I think it's like a really fair and responsible way of doing it. Um, is there anything that Mango Mint does? Like, I know you guys have so many features that like kind of complements this about like setting our hours and setting boundaries around that. Yeah, I think there's so much like what you do in Mango Mint, what you do in most softwares, but what's really special about Mango Mint is you know, you set those hours and I really relied on my online booking. So for the most part, if I had somebody reach out to me via, you know, a messenger or that, that email or even on Instagram, uh, even on Yelp, the only thing we would do, we would never book their appointment through a back and forth. Mm -hmm. We would dial down the service type and then we would send them the direct link to book that service. Okay. What that did is it gave them the immediate availability for a partial highlight with me. If they could not find something within that window that works for them, they could go ahead and put themselves on a wait list that would notify me should something come available in the yeah. time that they put themselves on the wait list. Yeah. So I do really like when you get to that level where you people need to be squeezed in because you're so busy. Yes, raising prices can help, but not in the immediate. Um, you can have an automated wait list. It's intelligent. It lets you know if something becomes available and you can just plug them in, give them the express booking link. They see that that's now available. They can either book it or after 15 minutes, you can send it to the next person. Um, so there's little features like that that are going to work in the background for mm -hmm. you. So you're not constantly top of mind with, Who's on my wait list? Who's trying to get in? Yeah. Um, who's trying to push outside of my boundaries? So it's very set it and forget it and then use the systems. Yeah, I love that. That is so smart. I love that, um, that feature that you guys have. Okay, so last topic I wanted to talk about is specifically, I think it's very um, pertinent, especially to hairstylists, and it's about redos. Um, so can you tell us a story of a time yourself when you had a client or maybe like lots of experiences where you had a client that wanted to read you and it was just like a really stressful or difficult moment for you. Yeah, I can think of a few off the top of my head. And I would say that with every single redo that's coming to mind, it all goes back to the failure on the service provider's part to gather enough information in the consultation mm. and to deliver that information in a way that that customer understood what the process would actually look like. Yeah. So I think, think of one in particular that was, um, it was actually, so I mentioned when I first started doing hair, I was in the specialized salon and I was only doing haircuts. After uh, that was about four years that way, I transitioned into a generalizing salon and was learning how to do color, taking, you know, everything I learned from the colors I had worked with. And, you know, you have some training, but I really just dove into it. And this was my first full highlight client. And she was a transition from an all over blonde to a highlighted look. 
meanwhile, as I start doing the service, she starts sharing, you know, the, the trials and tribulations she's going through in life at that time. And it was like, oh, this isn't a good time for you to make a change. <laughs> <laughs> and had I properly explained to her what a, what a dramatic change that is and how to prepare for it and what to expect that day, because you're going to have your natural color between some of these highlights. Like you're going to, in general, feel darker, even though you're technically going lighter. Yeah. Uh, so I look back on that and I think this was just about me slowing down and taking time to communicate. Mm -hmm. But if I've got the type of schedule where I'm stacking people in and squeezing people in at the end of my day, I don't have time to do that. Yeah. So it's really about adjusting the type of services you want to deliver. And I think in a high end, high value, high cost business model, your redos should most likely be free. Hmm. Yeah. The reason being is if you're charging a premium and you are, you know, deep diving into your consultations, really doing your best to understand and actually communicating to your customer. And you're one of those people that's sharing on Instagram, you got to charge what you're worth. Okay. Well, what are you worth? Are you really going to be able to deliver to somebody the expectation that they're coming in for, whether it's delivering it in the service or in the communication that says this is going to take four services to get there. Right. Because if you explain to them properly, that it's going to take four services to get there and they're going lighter. And a week later, they're like, oh, man, my toner faded hard. You want to bring them back in and give them that experience. So the next visit, they still want to come to you and not go try this process with someone else. Yeah. The only caveat to that um, is you can let those this is high value, high cost, high end business model. You can let those customers know that in order to receive those types of services, where if in a week from now, in two weeks from now, if you feel like your toner or your ends just aren't working for you, something's not working, those are available to you if you take home the proper home care maintenance kit. Mm. So if they take the insurance kit, the insurance kit doesn't work. I believe that you should take care of them no cost. Yeah. Yeah. That's so good. If you were the opposite model, which is, you know, low cost, um, for a lot of people, that's, that's a great value. But if you're in a low cost model, um, you're really worried about the margins of timing and you're really like back to back to back, you know, there are businesses out there that don't blow dry hair. Like there's no problem with that. There are salons out there that are, you know, quickie facials. There are nail salons out there that are, you know, I saw one the other day, she's like, we have a two day chip policy for gel. For a lot of people, they're like, I want a 10 day. Well, if you put that policy out there when somebody books, they have to agree to it and mm -hmm. adhere to it. So something in those low cost environments, those tend to be the environments where people raise their voices a little bit louder when something isn't great. Yeah. Um, so you just have to have a policy set in place. You know, when I think of a nail salon that's high cost, they also need to have a policy set in place, whether it's polish or gel, and then adhere to that within you know, certain boundaries. So if it's gel and it's more than, you know, three nails, then yeah, you can have a fee for that, but you've got to be able to like, just have it. So again, it just goes to setting what it is. Um, I've always worked in an environment where redos are free. The one thing I don't like is if you are a salon that you're a commission-based salon and you're an owner, I do not like if you're not charging the person, the client, don't charge the stylist. Hmm. To me, that's just like a don't charge the stylist. Don't take away their commission. But what you can build into your policy, and this again goes to the people you pick, the team you build, is they do need to see the same person they originally saw, if yeah. at all possible. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's such good advice. I love that. Okay, so um, I have asked you so many questions. You've given so many good answers. I love that. It's just once you put in those policies and those boundaries and you've got systems in place like Mangoment gives you, it kind of takes away that ickiness out of having those uncomfortable conversations. And unfortunately, that's just part of doing business and you have to find a way to deal with it. So thank you for giving us the tools and the ideas for how to put those into place. Um, Marshall, can you quickly tell us a little bit about Mangoman and 
who it's for and how it's different from other salon and spa softwares out there. Yeah, it's interesting that you say this because I, I do have a lot of opinions on all of these topics. And one of the things that I watched happen with my business when I implemented a software that, like I said, just kind of creeps in in all these areas in the background is I don't have to, you shouldn't have to think about these top of mind every day. Mm -hmm. So the biggest thing that comes up for me is, you know, Mangament is known as being fast. It's beautiful. It's got smart automations. Our goal is to reduce the amount of time that you have to do on those admin day-to-day tasks. But what it's really going to do is it's going to reduce the amount of time that you need to be on top, like top of mind, communicating these types of policies. Yeah. Um, Top of mind on how you're going back and forth with booking somebody. The booking process should be easy. Mm -hmm. And when you're ready to relinquish that idea of control and allow a system to come in place and save you a lot of time, that's who Mangoman is for. Yeah, I love that. Um, So Mangoment does so much. It's more than just booking and there's so much good stuff in there. And if you guys want to check out Mangoment, amazingly smart software for salons and spas, um, there's a link below this video in the description. And if you're reading the blog post, there's also a link there to check it out. Um, and I think you're going to love it. So thank you, Marshall, so much for coming on it. Thank you for spending your time with us and giving us so many great ideas. I learned so much. I really appreciate you. You as well. Have okay, a good one. Okay. Thanks. Bye everyone.